Hey y'all, this is part two of the mammal notes. First up is ungulates. They are animals with hooves. This includes deer, sheep, pigs, horses, giraffe, cows, antelope, camels, moose, and every other animal that has hooves. Um, they technically do walk on their toes. Um, many, but not all of them, are going to either have antlers or horns. Um, and this group is considered um, what accounts for majority of the wor world's herbivores. Right. Horns are hollow sheaths of keratinized epidermis arising from the skull. They are not shed, and they don't branch off. Um, they do grow continuously, and they're found in both males and females. Antlers, on the other hand, are composed of solid bone when they're mature. Um, they develop under a covering of highly vascular soft skin called velvet. And except for caribou, they're only found in males. Um, the breeding season, which is typically going to be the fall, um, the blood vessels constrict and the, the males will remove the velvet by rubbing the antlers on trees or other things they find. Um, and the antlers are shed after the breeding season. And then each year antlers will become bigger and more elaborate than the previous year. Next up is flying squirrels. Flying squirrels are found in southeastern Canada, the eastern U.S., and Mexico into the Honduras. And they're, they're as actually as common as gray squirrels are, um, but they're nocturnal um, rodent species, that, and they glide silently through the woods while most of them are sleeping, so we don't really get to see them. Um, versus gray squirrels we see all the time because they're out during the day. Um, loggers, rehabbers, bird watchers are virtually the only people that really get to see them out in the wild because they're the ones looking for them all right or out when they're out all right so the term flying is somewhat misleading these don't they're not actually they don't actually fly they glide um they're not capable of true flight um they have what's called a patagum which is a furred membrane of skin stretching from the forelimb um to the hind limb so basically if you had a piece of skin going from like your wrist to your ankle that's stretched along the body, that's what the patagum is. Um, so underneath this, this skin, this patagum um, is long thin muscle groups that control some of its movement. And along the edge lies a group of intertwined muscles that serve to hold the skin flaps to various degrees of tautness as required during its glide. When they're not gliding, there's another muscular group that controls the now loose skin, keeping it out of the way when it's running, walking, and sitting. Right. The gliding is achieved by this animal launching off the tops of trees and extending its flaps of skin stretched from arms to its legs, um, which you can see here in this picture. Um, they're highly maneuver maneuverable while in flight, um, and they steer. the steering is accomplished by adjusting the tautness of the patagum and largely controlled by the wrist bone. Um, the tail acts as a stabilizer in flight, much like the tail of a kite, um, and it's used for braking prior to landing on a tree trunk. All right, so there's one in flight, there's one not in flight. All right. For bats, they are actually obviously capable of true flight. A bat's forelimbs are developed as wings, making them the only mammal ca um, naturally capable of true flight. Their wings are similar in to, structurally similar to a human hand. And similar to flying squirrels, they also have that patagon membrane between the fingers that also stretches between the hand and the body. Um, so you can see that here, which you're probably already aware of, that um, piece of skin between their bones is the patagum. There are two types of bats, um, mega bats and micro bats. Uh, about 70% of bats are insectivores or insect eaters, and almost all the rest are going to be frugivores or fruit eaters. Right. Bats are present throughout most of the world and perform vital ecological roles such as pollinating flowers and dispersing fruit seeds. Many tropical plants depend entirely on bats for this, the distribution of their seeds. For mega bats, these are generally the larger bats. They're going to eat fruit, nectar, or pollen. They have really good eyesight, and most of them will not use echolocation. Examples of mega bats include flying foxes, blossom bats, and others. Micro bats, or small bats, eat insects. They generally don't have good eyesight, so they do use echolocation. Examples include the little brown bat and the big brown bat, which are both common to Georgia. Um, and there are actually 16 different species of these guys that are common to Georgia. All right. um, that is all for part two of the notes.